Welcome to our next uh, Flash webinar. Uh, and today we are talking about uh, how to use uh, global talent to scale up your startup by outsourcing the talent. And really happy um, to have here today uh, with me Paavo Pauklin from uh, Netcorp. Welcome. Hey. So as um, always, um, we collected um, some uh, uh, questions uh, from uh, the audience. And um, just quickly, uh, we share with you what are the topics uh, we are going to cover. So main interest was about uh, leading global teams that so when you outsource, uh, your team is uh, not in one premise how to build a culture, how to deal with salary, time differences, motivation, um, and uh, is there a possibility to get the same working team together after a year? Uh, then acquiring talent, that if you ha are a, a software house outsourcing the services, how do these guys acquire talent? And has it changed um, during these uh, recent uh, uh, crisis events? and how to be a smart buyer, that how to select and validate uh, software houses uh, from whom you can uh, outsource uh, product development, um, how to do the pricing issues and um, uh, how to protect your uh, IP. Um, so these are roughly the topics um, we are going to cover, but um, let's first uh, start with um, uh, how does the NetCorp work or what's the structure? What's the logic? Uh, whom do you help uh, with uh, outsourcing services and how do you do it? All right. Well, NetCorp is a software development uh, outsourcing agency and we provide software development resources uh, to our clients. And our, our own development bases are in Poland and most of the clients are in Nordic, Central Europe and US. Um, so in addition to providing our, our own like, uh, resources, we provide, uh, we have a quite um, wide network, uh, network of, uh, of partners from all over the world because um, uh, the needs of, of talent are very different, also the price tolerance levels. And so we try to always match what we cli our clients want. Um, we also consult companies because many companies are Mm, who haven't tried outsourcing before, they uh, have questions, how to start, how to evaluate partners, where to look, is Poland better than Ukraine or India, and how to organize internally. And so there's a lot of things that companies can do in order to prepare for mm, better success in the outsourcing part. So one of the first questions uh, for startups is that uh, when is uh, outsourcing a viable option for uh, for a startup? But uh, usually it's associated with uh, like scaling up where I'm already having, let's say, a team of uh, 30, 50. Um, and then I want to um, grow fast. And uh, then I outsource like 100 guys uh, from uh, uh, Pakistan or India or mm -hmm. Poland. And uh, then I can... Uh, uh, speed up uh, my uh, product development or um, whatever is task I have in hand. Uh, what's the reality? Uh, you being in the business, uh, how big or young the startup or, or old the startup has to be in order to benefit from outsourcing? Mm -hmm. Well, the practice is really diverse. Uh, you've seen startups that uh, that you, their first developers from us. And we see startups that actually want 30 people to double their team in order to really impress their investors or meet their growth exp exp expectations. So it's, it's very, very diverse. And outsourcing shouldn't be thought as I'll buy something cheap from India or something like this, which is some, uh, how it's very often mistakenly interpreted. Outsourcing is basically ability to buy external services from external partners. And this is just the key that opens up global talent. And you know, startups are in very different stages. And, and, and even if you have a starting idea, the, the capabilities and team and money situations are so different. So I'm, 
I actually have some slides about the different stages that uh, that the startups usually use and what what's the motivations there and, and and what do they use in different stages shall i bring it up sure yeah all right one sec So, should it should be visible right now? Yes. Um, so, different companies and, and startups use it in a very kind of uh, different way. And uh, the first stage usually, which is kind of the very start of a startup, and outsourcing is used then usually not by choice, but because you just don't have a dev team. <laughs> you have a great idea, and you might have some money. And you need to build something in order to impress new investors, attract new team members, get your idea across. So quite often outsourcing is used to draw up mockups and minimum viable products. They don't have to be perfect. They just have to show an example. And, uh, and their kind of the pro tip is that um, even if you're tempted to outsource to a cheap location, which is this stage kind of makes sense because it's relatively kind of simple, then the design part still should be in an area where there's good designers and good UX people because the, the mockups and the MVPs have to impress, impress people. And if you have those ready, then then it's very it's quite easy to to outsource in any part even even in the cheapest parts of of the world to just make a first version and and go with it so the second phase is usually when when the startup is like more established uh, five to twenty people maybe more and they usually have a situation where they have a team which is settled down and knows what they're doing but they have a growing backlog on the same time Mm, it's a bit difficult to attract additional talent, so it's not so easy. Um, and maybe they don't want all the talent to be there temporarily. They want somebody to help them to get uh, some of the backlog things cleared out, but they don't see a long-term need, or they need some building something on a, on a technology which they don't need per permanently. Or they're already thinking about, hey, we, we need to incorporate some externals in order to risk, let's say, lower the risk of running out of money before the next funding grow. Because, you know, letting go own people is very risky and can have a huge damage to your uh, reputation and internally. Uh, so reducing outsourcing teams is very easy and doesn't cause any panic. So, so this is usually the second stage where we get the normal ongoing product development. Um, then the third stage usually is when there's like real growth pressure and uh, I call it internal specializing. That means that, hey, you're already growing, you, your, your product has grown to be quite complex and your backlog log is way too long. You need somebody to take care of it. And especially in, in SaaS companies, it, it quite often happens where some big customers, they need either a lot of help in onboarding or they need customizations. And this really takes away the time of your own team to build a core product. And so you're in a question that who leads your product? Can I really have resources to lead the product and say, hey, I don't listen to the customers at the moment? Or I do the both. So, and the two last reasons here are the same as the, in the previous slide. So a lot of companies use outsourcing then to either help uh, in the core product, so their specialist can do the onboarding, or onboarding um, easier, uh, let's say, integrations, some customizations, which is very, very commonly used. And then there's this scale-up phase when you really need to grow. We had a case in Finland where the main reason for outsourcing was that um, the company got a really, let's say, a big uh, investment from a VC, uh, VC fund. And uh, the fund, uh, every fund wants the company to grow and then really to be more profitable once they want to sell it. 
So they had a goal to double or triple up their development team, which was about 30 people that back then. Um, but they could organically hire four people a year. So they had a problem, how to meet their investor expectations. And uh, they, they wouldn't so sexy startup. So outsourcing was, was the way to really grow it. And then and they succeeded very well with this. Mm. And, and in that phase, it already becomes also a, a risk management issue. So just to keep some people on the, on the outside payroll or let's say outside the organization, because if you have to re react to the volatility of, of your own finances or to the market, well, we see it today, even in the strongest ones are influenced. And that's, that's a strategical like uh, management uh, tool then. All right. Very cool. Uh, going back to the, like the first uh, stage where I'm building an MVP, um, at, what's my budget? Like if I have like thousand euros, is it like interesting at all for the, like the software outsourcing software houses to do me uh, design and um, maybe get some Indian guys to, to put together some kind of uh, click through uh, mock-up? Uh, well, luckily the world is full of different providers. So if it's not interesting for a really big company, then it's interesting for a smaller one or a more distant one. So there's a big market. You can get, if you can buy, you can, you can really get anything. So there's no minimum budget. You can get uh, 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 some designs and easy mockups for 400 euros or dollars. And, uh, but, and it kind of takes maybe a thousand to 10,000 euro, euros to build your first MVP. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's just a matter of uh, uh, finding the right guys uh, whose uh, scope and scale is uh, equal to the task, uh, what you have in hand. Yeah. Um, so this is like one of the biggest challenges that, uh, and we got also the questions that, how do I know uh, which country, from which country to outsource? Uh, what's uh, like a, uh, pros and cons of uh, Ukraine, Poland uh, versus mm -hmm. uh, India and Pakistan and so forth. Mm -hmm. I know you have a slide on that. Yes, I have a slide on that. Um, uh, I'll maybe do a small intro before. Well, um, for everything you should have your own, let's say a precise tool and understanding the market is, is very, very interesting and uh, essential. Because, uh, um, for example, if you, uh, if you make a really uncalculated choice, you might end up disappointed very fast and then you might hey, say, hey, all outsourcing is bad. It's, it's kind of like if your first or one of the employees does not perform, you say, hey, all the employees are bad. So you should really know what, what, are, you going, what are you buying? Because different countries have different working culture, the business culture, working ethics, uh, values, uh, communication levels, abilities to really, well, not to listen. There's difference between listening and understanding and how proactive they are. So knowing these things is really important because it's very difficult to kind of, it's pointless to accept, accept, uh, uh, expect um, oranges from an apple tree, tree. In the sense that, that you can't really have a smooth communication or proactive thinking in some parts of the world. Although in, in, um, in countries, however, in countries which are closer by and can really have the proactive and really good quality, then usually the price tag is a bit higher. And so um, it's, it's kind of for everything, but uh, every, every part of the world has their own pluses and minuses. But it's very important that people kind of evaluate the risks um, and I'll maybe talk the risks and then the evaluation criteria uh, about things. All right, is it visible? Yeah. So the risks of outsourcing, um, which everybody has to really kind of consider are there's quite quite a long list of these. 
and these influence the business model or outcome of the, of the corporation in many ways. And also how also the investors look at this, that, hey, if you're outsourcing from that part, this might be risky. And if you're not, if you're outsourcing there, okay, then it's fine. So first and most important thing is the business culture risk, because this influences the everyday work. So for example, if, if we're talking about the perspective of Europeans, because we are sitting in Europe at the moment, and I know that there might have some uh, US listeners there and so on, you have to choose somebody that's really either close to you or you, you should know what to expect. Europeans, the closer the people are, the more similar they are with you. And you can expect to talk in same terms. And uh, you should know that if you, for example, go to Asia, then uh, uh, some of the perspectives are totally different. Um, uh, expecting proactiveness there is is not the very wise thing. So you should already know that, hey, they do some things technically very well, but I have to tell them everything and really put my, my extra hours on the communication and specification and so on. So I, I should know what I'm getting. And uh, how to know these things? Just to ask the people that have, have tried these, but uh, there's a lot of articles in the internet about different business cultures and so on. I think that it's very often kind of undervalued by startups is the legal risk. And this mainly concerns uh, intellectual property protection and uh, GDPR risks uh, in Europe. Um, because many countries that seem uh, very attractive on the price level are not covered at all on the intellectual property rights um, scenario and also GDP. And well, GDPR can be kind of not avoided, but, but handled, but you need to prepare a lot of things for that. Communication structures, processes, and so on, but it's a hassle. Uh, and there's a certain what do you mean by GDPR risk. If I'm ordering some code to be developed in, in China or in India, mm -hmm. how does uh, the GDPR influence me? I just order a code and I get it and it's done. But um, in what instances it actually becomes a risk for me? Mm -hmm. uh, some of your code uh, that, uh, that they are making might process uh, personal data. Okay. And uh, you have to be really sure that this doesn't leave the, uh, the, the areas that it's re restricted to. And how do they develop and how do they use test data and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. And how do you secure that the, this study isn't leaked uh, afterwards. Uh, but the intellectual property is something really interesting. Uh, of course, many startups think that, hey, money is most important, but would you really go into court battle in Russia, for example, about your IP? Mm -hmm. Probably not, but, uh, but you really have to kind of evaluate these things. And talent pool risk is, uh, is just availability, uh, but this is a highly available information. How many developers are kind of let out of universities every year? What is the current pool of people? Because if it's a very low or uh, availability area, then one big or one or two or three big companies can really dry the market up Mm. Uh, this happened, uh, I think, in Romania and some of the cities where, where three big companies went and, and hired everybody. And a place that was like, hey, that's a good place to go, it was very impossible to hire anybody afterwards. Mm. But so, um, communication risk, which relates a lot to the first point business culture. So, English proficiency, which, for example, in China is really low, although technical skills are very high. Um, and kind of the listening and understanding things. Um, we, we see in many let's say, teams challenges or with the customers that if, if, um, if one or, or, or many of the developers is not very smooth in English, um, uh, it might cause some, uh, some problems if they have to participate in a communication. If the structure is made in a way that they don't have to, and let's say the team lead does, then it's no problem. But, but uh, yeah, talking to the whole team before you hire this is a, is a good thing. Uh, utility risk. This is kind of something that I didn't really consider a risk before uh, now, <laughs> recently. But we've heard a lot of um, 
problems during at the moment the, the crisis time where people have to work at homes mm-hmm. and where for example in uh, we heard it for for india that uh, that uh, the development centers they have good cables and they have really good stable internet but if people have to work from homes they don't have internet or it's very 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 bad internet and the electricity might come we did once uh, a small project with uh, with the outsourced guy from uh, from Asia, and we had two days when he didn't have electricity. Can't really do anything about it. Seems like we don't have electricity. It's it's not like you go somewhere else. So, uh, but but this is a, ther- a theoretical risk, which can be really actual. <laughs> Currency risk is, is also something. Uh, which is at the moment, for example, it might offer some opportunities uh, during bad times. Because uh, usually, let's say Polish water and then uh, Grivna in Ukraine are lower, so you can buy more for a euro or dollar, which is good. But also that means that if the currency exchange rate gets back to normal, the vendors might be cornered and you might have to raise the prices. So it's, it's a short term thing. It's more of a vendor problem. But it also means that if uh, the price, the, like actual money value is too low, uh, their motivation to finish your pro- uh, project might decrease uh, with, uh, uh, with mm-hmm. the currency valuation going down. Yeah, of course. If, if, if they get, a, let's say today, make a, make a good deal and uh, the money value is lowered by 30% and they are they lose all their margin or even have to pay on top, then of course they'll do anything to get out of the deal or you know, negotiate the, the terms. So that's kind of obvious. And, uh, and saying that uh, usually by the time that the volatility is over, the demand is also back. So they actually have plans to choose from. Mm-hmm. So it, it has to be a win-win situation and kind of keep that in mind. And of course there's like a, partner default risk and quality risk, but these can be quite easily determined by looking at the history and and really talking to customers that they work with. And um, and, and, uh, doing pilots, you have to have a budget for pilots. Mm -hmm. This is kind of, yeah, and testing people, uh, which is usually that companies don't. But if you make a bad choice, you should say, hey, okay, I'll take the money in or the loss in and, and continue with others. So, mm-hmm. so this is because on paper, everybody looks awesome. Mm-hmm. If you look at the references of outsourcing companies, they're like, one is it's, it's too good to be true. Mm-hmm. They'll do everything for nothing and don't, don't ask money for this. And so mm-hmm. it's like, hey, but so, reality can be really different. So your pro tip is uh, talk to the customers uh, should I get the client list to talk to uh, with uh, from an uh, outsourcing company uh, or should I do my homework and uh, contact uh, the clients they, uh, they are uh, telling mm-hmm. about on their website or, or somewhere else? Or? Well, usually they don't, don't tell about the bad clients on the website. <laughs> and, and if you put like, I don't know, Intel on the website, who are you going to call in, 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 by the, from the secretary? Mm-hmm. So... Ask, ask them and uh, believe them. It's, it's, it's in the details. But I actually, well, it used to be my number one recommendation that I go on site and visit them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Just to go around and see that if the office is and if I would like to work there. Mm-hmm. It's usually a partner that where, hey, I would really like to work there. The offices are nice. The atmosphere is nice. But uh, now you really can't do that. So you have to rely on other, other uh, kind of... Uh, References, mm-hmm. if you do video goals and if they don't have internet, they can't make it, it's not going to work afterwards. Mm-hmm. So just okay. talk to people a lot and, and, uh, and uh, real life practice, like have a week of testing. Okay. Take the team for a week or for a month to a pilot. You can okay. see in everyday life that uh, how they perform and it's uh, the risk is only one month cost. Mm-hmm. And usually this is the cheapest way to choose a partner. Are there any like uh, uh, tricky questions or, or smart questions to ask uh, like from uh, 
their previous clients or which would reveal that uh, how it's actually to work with uh, with them but even if they are uh, like uh, tell you the or direct you to the best uh, best customers they have it's still like uh, maybe you can um, with smart questions you what, what are the right questions to ask or let's put it mm -hmm. this way There's no tricks that would lure out uh, the things, but it's if you can really talk to the people that, that did, uh, did the service, mm -hmm. try to understand what exactly was the responsibility and okay. how did it perform. Every, every project has some problems. Uh, ask about them and, and you can see how much details do they give. Mm, it's, um, it's it pretty much usually gets you understanding that what are the communication problems or, or what kind of challenges how did you use the communicate the how was the communication structured for example mm -hmm. and what kind of input they did so if you understand what what was their cooperation then you might understand that it went well but, but even the good companies have like bad experiences so mm -hmm. it's it's really like trying and understanding that if, if they they the the real practice So the last thing is kind of the, maybe the question which is most asked by the, by the startups or, or afraid, uh, let's say, what are they mostly afraid about the outsourcing is that do the outsiders or outsourced people care about my company enough to really put effort in it? Um, and also how to I pre prepare myself? So I'm not sure if, how do you want to tackle these questions? Uh, let's talk about them. It's uh, both are really good, and uh, I would add also the third one that uh, if I'm outsourcing, uh, the investors are al always looking at, uh, hey guys, you're outsourcing uh, like a core development or so much that there is no uh, no knowledge in house. Why should I invest in your company? That every 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 all the knowledge is out of your your company, and you don't. Mm -hmm. even so it's like a third issue that uh, mm -hmm. so. Caring about uh, um, and uh, how to prepare. So mm -hmm. let's start about the caring part. That uh, mm -hmm. how, how to get the outsourcing team to care about uh, your product. Mm -hmm. Let's say that I'm yeah. already valid validated the software house. I'm uh, feeling good about it. I did my one month of uh, cooperation. It seems that these guys know what they are doing. That I can use them, and now. What next? How do I build this uh, uh, build this uh, trust and uh, and uh, motivation that they care about my my product? Mm -hmm. Well, first treat them as your own people, and the same with the same respect. Um, if you treat them as as outside vendors, you will get the vendor quality or the attitude. Uh, if you really kind of talk like us, like use the terms us and then and, and tell them about the big picture and why we do stuff. And if you might now have like virtual party or something, uh, it makes them feel a part of a project. And if it's a, a bit of a wider or longer cooperation, uh, if you work like three years on a project, you will start looking, let's say, feeling a part of that. And if you have this, this kind of good chemistry between the teams, even working in different companies, you will get the, the kind of uh, attitude that, hey, I, I worked yesterday until 2 a.m. to fix some speed issue because I wasn't satisfied. Mm -hmm. If you start them like whipping uh, like, like outside vendors that, hey, why, where did you spend these two hours? Then they will do the eight hours a day and then which is in Jira market and you get that. So you, you get what you want, but you have to also understand that they, even though they are kind of in the team, they work for another company. They are every day influenced by the values and the, and the culture that's in the company they work. Um, so you shouldn't expect that they are as enthusiastic as the founders or the others. They might love your product and be like, Hey, yeah, that's a cool product. I'll help, I'll help you guys. But sometimes their professionalism, which is, is kind of more valuable than just enthusiasm. 
if you're, for example, if the product is, is led by a very motivated and enthusiastic product owner from the client side, and they have a highly skilled team from the outsourcing side, then it can be a killer and a winning combination. Very cool. So it, uh, treat them as part of your team with some uh, uh, limits that they still work for somebody else and it should be part of your due diligence that uh, is the culture they are working in. Is it supporting your values and uh, your understanding yeah. how the teams uh, should work? And uh, uh, if they have a, a very enthusiastic and energetic uh, uh, product uh, owner or product uh, pr uh, manager uh, with whom they like to work with and uh, in case they kind of feel that uh, working in this project I will uh, increase my professional skill set or, or my level that uh, mm -hmm. it kind of adds on to my, my skills mm -hmm. then, then they are like uh, motivated that they're the guys uh, who work at software houses they go there for increasing their, their motiv main motivation is to increase their uh, professional skill set and work on different cool projects mm -hmm. that not to get bored uh, doing the yeah. same same stuff all over. Yeah. Uh, well, am I correct? Yeah, of, uh, mostly yes. The, the people are, um, they don't want to be maybe tied up to one project. They want the variety and that the, the changes uh, from time to time. They want to have experience with different technologies. They want to have different specialists kind of be a generalist and then build their portfolio and their skill set because software development evolves very, very rapidly. What if you, they don't want to end up in a company that uses the same technology for five to 10 years and then it's already, already a legacy and then you don't have any, any actual skills on the, on the labor market that you can could, uh, could sell in, in the words. So they really want to be on top of the game and do their, their, their thing professionally. But of course, we're talking about, again, come back to the, for every task, you should have a right tool. If the client wants somebody that does exactly what they do and doesn't suggest anything, then you should go to a specific area or location or a country mm -hmm. to find these resources. Mm -hmm. If you really want somebody to, that will challenge your ideas and recommend that, hey, this is the, a better way to do it, then you should go to Central Europe, for example. Cool. So we talk, uh, talked about uh, how to make sure that the uh, outsourcing team uh, takes good care of my product and is uh, positively uh, motivated to, to work on my project. Uh, then comes a question about uh, how to prepare uh, for outsourcing, mm -hmm. that, uh, how to become like a smart buyer. We talked about the risks. Let's say that I dealt with the risks that uh, mm -hmm. I kind of figured out that I need uh, at the design part, I need somebody who can actually do European design. Um, and then um, with, uh, with the development, um, uh, I probably go for uh, Polish guys, they are culturally fit, that uh, they understand, uh, I know how to communicate with them better than with uh, Indian or Pakistani guys. Um, what else, how, how else uh, should I prepare or decide that uh, is this now a good time to outsource? Mm -hmm. Well, outsourcing requires that you're, you're somewhat organized. You can't really say that uh, as many people do with onboarding that, hey, come to the spot to learn while, while doing it. And you're asked over the counter. You really have to think through what are, you, what are you buying? What are you ordering? You have to get your backlog together, prioritization together, and really kind of, you should have kind of product management. Uh, or a product owner. I always recommend the company has the product owner, not to outsource this, because you know your business, you know your priorities. So this is the this is the one thing that somebody should be um, responsible for the outsourcing corporation. Not to divide it by by so many people. There's one person that's responsible, and usually that somebody, if it's just starting a corporation, somebody who is also connected with the product, who knows how to be supportive for the for outside team, outside the uh, uh, team. Um, then is getting everybody else in your own company on board with the idea that hey we're gonna outsource, because in practice we've seen that some developers might seem threatened by the thought that hey there's gonna be some Polish guys doing development now. What's gonna 
what's going to happen to my job? Is the company doing to replace me or are they doing to grow the company? What's my role there? How can I help? And so on. And this was a, has been an issue in, in two cases where we uh, saw a real threat of internal resistance. We already started and then, uh, then we saw, hey, the, the client's team is not on board. We saw some resistance that, hey, well, the information is not shared. We see that maybe the evaluation is too critical and th there's loads of things. So getting your own team members to understand why are we doing this? Well, how does it help our company? What is their role and how can they help? Uh, and, and you really want to, for example, you, you need to want this to succeed. It's, it's, it's no point to buy outsourcing services and, hey, show me what you can do that, hey, I know that I wanted you to paint the wall like red. I see it's yellow. I'll tell you after the project. So, so it's well, like, yeah. I just recently heard a good example of it that uh, if I told you that I want it uh, square and green, you should have understood that I meant round and red. <laughs> Yes. So, so getting the people on board and own developers that, hey, how does it influence them is really essential. Hey, we're going to do this. And also, what are the, what's our expectations? What do we want to get out of this? And do we have like an end point also until what time we want to use this? And, and also that how, what is a good, good result for us or a good partner? Uh, if you think these through, then you know when you're not getting it and you should replace something because it's it's so dangerous to go with the first option and stick with it even if it's bad so kind of like going back to your uh, suggestion that uh, do a pilot or test test run for a month mm -hmm. and uh, if it doesn't work out uh, figure out what went wrong and go out and uh, find the right guy because the global market is so big that there's definitely uh, right competence uh, with the right price tag for you like definitely yeah sure uh, you mentioned that uh, you should do your planning and uh, get that right uh, in startups usually um, the problem is that uh, we have like a three months time hori horizon that we know uh, what's the priority list or, mm -hmm. or um, uh, functionality we are building uh, for the next uh, three months and then it's uh, up to the market uh, to, to say us that uh, what are the next priorities and, and we are constantly searching and trying to figure out what's the product market fit. Uh, in, in these situations it's bloody hard to like plan something for like cooperation for three years. Uh, can I use outsourcing in that instance or is there a way how to make it work? Nobody should make three years plans in startups. <laughs> but uh, if you use agile methodology, that you have like a week or two week sprints and you're really uh, holding your hand on the process, you see exactly what is uh, developed and you get instant feedback. If the, if the as for example, filling out or doing the tickets takes, takes that much time as, as, as expected, or, or it takes longer, or there's some other problems, you get really instant feedback. Of course you can plan, of course. It, the trick is that how difficult is onboarding to your own system. If you have a spaghetti code and you have a lot of legacy and so on, then of course it is difficult, but then again, how do you onboard your internal people? If now everybody works remotely, the process is exactly the same. There's no difference. So the onboarding is just, a, it's another really big topic, how to onboard people. Um, but, uh, but, uh, but there's, uh, but you have to just kind of, th there's no stopping that. Let me rephrase this. Um, you have to, if you have a backlog and you have a prioritization and you can onboard people, then you can use outsourcing for two weeks if, if, if needed. Of course, for two weeks, there's no point really because getting up to speed takes time even for the really good professionals. And it might take one or two or three months for them to get really up to speed. And then like, hey, they provide really good quality. So you shouldn't be afraid of, of the short, uh, short time intervals.
you probably couldn't hire anybody for three months anyway. All right. So like, uh, like for a meaningful piece, we talked about like uh, doing the mock-ups and MVP even probably you can, but uh, if it's like any uh, bigger getting rid of my backlog, then um, the project has to be more than three months. Otherwise it's not interesting or most probably, well, it has to have some perspective. Okay. Unless it's a, it's a clear feature. We have some requests that, Hey, we, we need to uh, take care of this um, or, or that kind of a thing. And it takes two months. That's fine. But I was more of a uh, referring to that. It's difficult to hire internally, employ anybody as an alternative for three months anyway. Okay. So it's, it's maybe for the short ones, it's easier to use outside people. Okay. So the third, uh, we talked about like uh, preparing for outsourcing, uh, doing your homework at the, how easy or difficult it is to onboard somebody else to your system, maybe cleaning something up to make it smoother, uh, figuring out uh, how long you want this cooperation to go, community, communicating to your team that uh, these are the terms and it's not for uh, uh, firing you, but uh, these are the reasons why we are doing this. Um, and um, definitely going agile, um, this assures the, the quality and uh, making sure that you have the right partner and so forth. Um, and the planning part is like planning the sprints in the right way and, uh, and so mm -hmm. forth and uh, expectations and so forth. Um, so we talked about that part. Now a third question we had was about uh, investor side that uh, if you are outsourcing investors don't like it because uh, all the knowledge is outside your company mm -hmm. and uh, there are like uh, tons of issues um, mm -hmm. with that that you don't build the uh, internal competence and uh, and so mm -hmm. forth. So what's your view on this? Mm -hmm. uh, well they're they're right you shouldn't outsource all the knowledge and all the core competences because the core the, the main point is that you have to have independency from the outsource team you shouldn't be dependent on one team in who knows where to to for your product to exist so you can start with with outsourcing some the first phase and so on but as soon as possible they have to build up the core competences so you you shouldn't outsource um, also that if you have some team, but that, but making the core core of your product, like solely to, to the outsource team, that doesn't mean that you can't develop it with them. It's very widely used that so you have a core team. We have people working with the, with the internal team. That's, that's usually fine. That that's usually also fine for the investors. The investors want to really be sure that if something happens with the partnership, you're not hostage by it and and you can really survive for example if you have to scale down for three months and let all the outsource people go you have to have capabilities to uh, at least fix bug keep your service up and make some small advancements so uh, yeah you, you shouldn't uh, move all the core competence there we have some 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 uh, like uh, examples that are uh, in opposite direction to what I just said, the real market sometimes just acts in a different way. Uh, we are building for a Norwegian fintech. Uh, they, their main, let's say, presentation lever or access to customers is Android and iOS app. And we have built 90% of both of these apps. So we were kind of first developers in and we still develop these. So it's kind of their core pro product to the customer. But then again, their core value is somewhere else and the development of these things, if it's well documented, can be taken over anytime. So it's so and so. They are kind of dependent on us, but, but we have documented in a way that and then structured it that they can actually take it over. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is important that how you agree, of course, documentation takes time and money, but you should kind of have some kind of understanding what is the minimum level of documentation that you need in order for anybody from your internal team or somebody else to jump in and understand that, hey, how, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. So this is also like a question to your own team, but uh, what kind of documentation do we need in order to mm -hmm. take care of whatever yeah. your own mm -hmm. skill level is, but it, it determines uh, how well the stuff should be documented. And uh, yeah, yeah. 
Well, yeah, the investors side, coming back to commenting this, investors just want to be sure that, that you can continue building the, the startup. Mm -hmm. mm, but uh, especially nowadays, I, I, I believe that they also see the value in the flexibility of the outsourced work and uh, the scale up capabilities. Mm, there is one topic, if we have time to talk about it, which is a called, uh, outsourcing method called BOT, Build, Operate, Transfer, which is specially used in cases on demand of on investors. It basically means that, for example, we have a startup and their investor is a bit hesitant of, of using outsourcing, but they need outsourcing, let's say, more people to grow. So what we do is that we build them their own team their own future team in Poland, for example, uh, 10, 20, 30 people. And uh, we build it up and uh, for example, if they have been outsourced from us two or three years, then we can initiate the process where they take this company over or these people to their own balance sheet. So this is kind of gives them a security that they can trigger this event after certain criteria have been met that they can actually buy out team. Is it used often or is it uh, something very new or what's the market situation? Mm -hmm. Not really often because this is not offered to the, let's say you can't have this situation with two developers. Mm -hmm. There's no point for anybody to offer this if it's a low number. So it's usually above 15, 20 developers. And mm -hmm. this is also the size that makes you, like make sense for you, for, for the customer to have a development team. Mm -hmm. There's no point of having an office for five people. It's maybe too, the side costs are too high. Mm -hmm. But uh, mm, there's a, the, let's say the percentage of uh, having these clauses versus percentage of actually executing these clauses is maybe 95 to five. So 95% these clauses are not executed and 5% they are. Okay. But it's a good security. It seems like a good security methods for for the investor and the startup. But what happens in reality is that they find out that hey, this works as it is, and we actually need the flexibility. Mm -hmm. It's just a a good way to um, uh, argument with or negotiate with investors or to to sell them the idea that uh, outsourcing uh, can work. Well, it feels more safe. Mm -hmm. uh, one topic we haven't uh, talked about is uh, you mentioned it, that there's a culture differences. I know that you have a great slide about uh, comparing different cultures. Uh, so let's uh, talk about that also. Uh, the regional evaluation slide. Yes. Mm -hmm. Regional evaluation. Well, this is mo mostly connected to the topic that how to choose a, a development partner or where should I outsource? Is it Ukraine, Pakistan, somewhere else? And uh, quite often people don't look at the, the big picture. What kind of, what are the macro, macro risks or benefits, good, the good and the bad of, of each uh, kind of uh, region? And um, and for, for us, you should evaluate actually four things. It's, it's mentioned free here, price, uh, talent availability, risks, and also quality. And I just made one example, uh, according to my own experiences. And uh, this kind of gives a, gives a good value, uh, overview of, of different things. So Estonia, which, uh, uh, ranks on the price level in worldwide kind of in the in the medium range it's not cheap but you get good quality for for the money so we talked about like uh, from 55 to 85 uh, hourly rate in case of estonia or yeah it depends yeah it it, it seems that uh, before crisis most of the prices were around let's say 65 to 80 mm -hmm. now it's 55 to 65 70 something like this it, it again depends on the on the company. At just commenting the prices. At the moment, the pricing situation globally is very uh, upside down. Uh, of course, there's like um, country averages that you should uh, kind of uh, get to know to 
but uh, some companies offer cheaper prices for people that are on the bench because the market is a bit shook up, uh, shooken up at the moment. And some of the clients have really uh, fastly or uh, reduced uh, the, the amount of people. So we also have some, let's say 10, 15 people on the bench. And it's, there's nothing to do with their quality. It's just their client said, hey, sorry, we're reducing at the moment. And the same situation is in Estonia, Ukraine, India, everywhere. So, but then again, with teams that have, uh, or companies that have a lot of clients and they are secure, you won't get any discount from them. <laughs> because, well, software projects are quite long-term. So, uh, Estonia example that uh, availability is quite low. It's okay for us and uh, to do some stuff locally. And it's okay if you can find like one or two or five people to work on your startup. Maybe more if you are a super sexy startup. Uh, there are companies that have been managed to hire, hire quite much, but, but it's a very rare case. Uh, the global, let's say the total talent pool is, is quite low. And that also influences the, the pricing level. And then again, the, the risk, while well, I talk about all the risk slides that I had, the political risk, the legal risk is very low. It's super transparent, it's, it's communication is good, everything is. And also the, the code quality, development quality is, is very high. If you want to have a quality job, hire a Estonian developer or a company. Uh, Poland kind of ranks in between of everything and then is very attractive in the outsourcing field. It has a low price compared to Estonia. The price is about in, in the range of 40, 45 euros an hour. Um, crisis times, we have managed to, or let's say, sell some other people with 35 euros. That's fine, but it doesn't apply to everything. Um, the ability, uh, availability is very high. It has 40 million people. Uh, every year, about 30,000 developers exit uh, the, the universities, which is more than the entire Scandinavia has developers. So it's a good comparison. And then again, it's European Union, the risks are very low and the quality is extremely high. One, one trick to look at the quality of development is, is to look at the startups. Where do they have startups? A lot and also to look at the university rankings and technology levels. This is kind of a fast, fast way to look at it. And also where have the big players made their development centers like Facebook, Intel, and Google, and so on. And I think everybody who is big is in Poland also. So Ukraine, low price, um, very high uh, good availability, but the risk is quite high and here, is mostly uh, political risk. Mm. We had several clients drawing out from Ukraine after the conflict with Russia and closing down their operations and uh, denying us or anybody else to develop any, their, any of their code in Ukraine, mm -hmm. which is a sad thing. They're very nice people, do very good code. And also the legal aspect there and IP protection and GDPR are some things that would concern me if I would go there. But the quality is, is quite high. Uh, with India, of course, very known low price. Just uh, going back to Ukraine. So yeah. the price level of Ukraine is equal to uh, Poland, uh, 40, 45? Ukraine is about uh, 10 to 5 euros uh, less per hour. Okay. Mm. So it, it is a bit cheaper. Um, you should expect to get a good developer with 30, 35, sometimes 40. It depends on the technology. And India, um, the availability, of course, is super high. We, they have companies that have 50,000 developers. <laughs> and, uh, but the risk is really high. The communication risk, the understanding of the project, you have to specify everything. Mm, not really getting the developers to think along and I'm talking about the averages now. They are like some of the world's best developers are from India and smartest people. I'm not talking about everybody. It's like they're huge and uh, they have some great talent there. 
in every country you can find super talent and average. I'm talking about what people have said in average and what, what's our kind of experiences. And the quality is something that you really can't brag about. But then again, it's really okay for the first and simple things. If you really know what to do that, hey, please do this kind of a WordPress page or this kind of a script or something else, it's fine, it's perfect. But to ongoingly develop your product, there might be some dangers because you might end up with a code that if some new thing is released, something else always breaks somewhere else and you don't know the reason. <laughs> yeah, that, that was it about this topic. Very cool. Um, so in your experience, uh, like the, in India case, uh, if it's simple things, you can pre-describe the tasks uh, very specifically and uh, you do frequent communication, it's actually possible to get some good co code uh, out of India also. Mm -hmm. I believe so. You just have to kind of be, be ready for what you're getting. Mm -hmm. That it is common that if the other part has a problem they won't really tell you that they have a problem before you ask. And it might be a week. Mm -hmm. Hey, I couldn't fix it there. And they say, yes, everything is fine. And I understand everything, but actually they don't. So use a lot of ref reflection. Make the other part reflect how they understood what were you saying. So um, it's been awesome uh, talking to you. Uh, we are soon running out of time. Um, I know you, you have one more awesome slide with uh, <laughs> with uh, some uh, reference materials and uh, links to uh, uh, outsourcing calculator. Um, so maybe. Uh, we can wrap it up um, with uh, some additional uh, materials. And um, what would be your like uh, final uh, uh, suggestion regarding uh, using outsourcing uh, mm -hmm. as a tool uh, in startups? Well, first of all, start using outsourcing ability to use outsourcing is a really big competitive edge because this opens up the possibility to use global talent. And you, because you don't have to then limit yourself with 50 kilometers from Tartu. So you can really buy from anywhere and, and, and use the best people. Um, try not to think of outsourcing, not as a cheap option, but rather ability to hire really the best people in that field with reasonable price maybe. So, and, and trying is the best way to learn, but you have to have a budget for this. So. It, everybody can say whatever they want, but just, I think, leap of faith, try and do the testing testings with, uh, with different partners. So you get the bad back feeling also that what, what do you want and what kind of partner suits you. Very cool. Thank you very much, uh, Pavo. Uh, I got a lot of uh, great stuff uh, out of uh, today's discussion. I hope uh, the same goes for the uh, audience. So thank you. Thank you and bye-bye. And uh, everybody uh, w wanting the uh, slides and my notes, then um, uh, the ones who signed up for this event will get it, get it by mail. And if you haven't signed up yet, uh, then do it and we'll send uh, the stuff uh, on your way. Thank you for joining and uh, stay healthy and see you around.